Okay, hello everyone. My turn to, to talk to all of you. And uh, I'm actually going to modify my presentation a bit and talk a bit more to some of the slides than I planned to because I've, a lot of what I heard today was very, very interesting. Thank you, Howard. I couldn't have asked for a better person to stand up before me uh, and actually talk about hyperconvergence hyper and where it makes more sense. Um, some of you have heard me talk before in some of the tech field days and the like. And from that you'll know I actually hate buzzwords. You know, we try and put great names on things uh, to actually make it sound more important than it actually is. We forget about the problems. What are the problems we're trying to solve in the first place? Why did we actually get there in the first place? And that's what I want to talk about before I go into the slide presentation a bit more, right? So um, I've been in the storage industry a long time. Uh, started in 1989. And at that time, I started a company called Eurologic. And Eurologic started to develop RAID systems and fiber channel, fiber channel SANS. Why? Because we needed to figure out how to share storage. So we solved that problem. We figured out how to share storage, and the market moved on. Then we said, why are we spending this amount of money on things like storage area networks? Can we not do this cheaper? Can we not use commodity hardware, x86 hardware? Can we not do it over Ethernet? And I started another company called Ellipsan. Everybody said it was crazy. They said, there's no way you can do storage protocols over IP. Just no way it's going to work. Well, guess what, guys? You're all using it today, right? So next thing, what happens? We say, well, can we not commoditize this further? Can we not make it simpler? Why do we have to have expensive trained IT guys that understand storage and nothing but storage with their own domains? Can we not actually improve the management? Can we not automate a lot of this and even commoditize further the hardware? And that's why I started StoreMagic because I said, yeah, I think we should be able to do that. So I started StoreMagic to actually turn everything into software using commodity hardware to simplify everything through management. About three years ago, someone decided to start calling it software-defined storage and hyperconvergence. So I have to use those terms now, but no, the problem we're trying to solve in the first place is to make things easier, to make things cheaper. Along comes the market, and the market says, hey, I like this software-defined storage, hyperconvergence, I can charge a lot of money for this. So what they actually do is they sell you an appliance, a big, complex appliance that has to have its own hardware. But that's what we're trying to get rid of. We're trying to commoditize the hardware and do everything in software. We're trying to bring you back to allow you to do it in software, allow you to choose the hardware that you want to use. So hyperconvergence, I have to stick with the buzzwords. It is here, it is growing. You need to make, understand where the right place is for it. Just some of the data on what's actually happening. Already uh, there's 24% of the market is supposed to be using hyperconvergence. 41% of the market planning to use hyperconvergence over the next couple of years. It is a large growing market. And what do we mean by hyperconvergence? This is the Gartner uh, um, version of what is meant by hyperconvergence. Fundamentally, when it comes down to it, it is server, storage, network, all managed by software. As simple as that. So what do we do? StoreMagic allows hyperconvergence to be made available to the entry level of the market. What's the entry level of the market? I'm not talking about necessarily small to medium-sized businesses, though that is a very good section in the market to use that technology. It could be very, very large enterprises with multiple remote locations, sometimes called robo. But if you look at some of our customers, we have things like wind farms. Well, I certainly would not call a wind farm in the middle of an ocean a remote office. We use the term distributed enterprise to describe. It's organizations that have different locations that the applications in those, those locations is key to their company. German Army uses us for battlefield communication systems. Is that a remote office? Last, I don't think I know many IT guys that want to be dropped into the middle of a battlefield to actually look after it. The basic principle of what they're looking for, they have key applications that must continue running. They need to service their customers. Their customers could be a retail store, a guy wanting to check out. The customer could be a battlefield communication system. It could be that wind farm. But those applications must run. And for that, they want to have some form of high availability. They want to be able to, if something fails, that their applications continue running, that they can move that application into another server seamlessly without the application even realizing a problem has actually happened. And they want to be able to manage that easily and simply remotely. They don't want to change it. They want it to work. Get it in there, get it working, make sure it solves the problem and it continues working. And anything to do with it 
they should be able to modify remotely. They should be able to see what's going on, modify what's going on. Even if something fails, they should simply be able to, to replace the failed component while the system is still live, during normal working hours. So I say entry level. This is uh, from a, a recent Gartner report. We have two partnerships I'll be telling you about in a few minutes where we make our software available to a couple of the better known server vendors, Cisco and Lenovo. Even though you would consider our software good at an entry level, simple, keep it extremely simple, both of them are positioned quite high by Gartner from the point of view of what these solutions can actually do for the market. So why, why do people particularly want these applications to continue running at the edge? Surely everybody's trying to move everything into the center or into the cloud. Well, that's a very, very dangerous strategy, and in some cases, not even a legal strategy. There's very good reasons why you don't want all your applications running in the cloud. You want to use the cloud. You want to take advantage of the cloud, very, very definitely. But you need to make sure that certain key applications can meet the service time requirement of your customer. So the type of problems, it could be bandwidth. It could be latency on your networks. Can you trust the network? If you're a wind farm, you can't trust the network. You're out in the middle of an ocean. If you're a battlefield, you can't trust the network. There's plenty of people who are trying to actually disrupt that for you. If you're a retail organization, you're spread across quite a wide area. You do not want to have a very, very expensive pipe going to every one of those retail organizations. So you need to build a certain amount of resilience and, late, uh, and latency that's acceptable. Availability, what happens if that fails? If retail organization, customer goes along with the trolley to the checkout, and you say, uh, I'm uh, sorry, would you, would, you, would you mind waiting a few minutes? We're just waiting for the server to reboot. 10 minutes later, that customer's going to walk. He's going to leave the trolley. You can go and put it back on the shelf yourself. And he's going to go to the competitor. So you need to make sure you're keeping the customer happy that the systems continue running. Compliance, where's the data? And security is related to this, so where's the data? Do you know where data has been kept? What legislation has been kept under? What country is that data in? Can the country that that, that data has been kept in change the law so that they can get access to your data? You need to make sure where your data is, and there is a lot of legal limitations now on where your data is actually kept. So what is it? What is it we do that I've been talking about here? We call our product SVSAN. Basically, it is a storage virtual appliance that allows you to build a hyper-converged or software-defined system. It sits on top of a hypervisor. That hypervisor, I'm not going to go into too much technical detail, by the way. If you want more later on, you can have a chat with ourselves at, at the back here. It sits on top of a hypervisor, and it'll actually take ownership of the storage that is within that server. That could be SSD storage, uh, that could be rotating disk drives. It takes ownership of it and makes it available to the hypervisor as a virtual storage appliance. It synchronously mirrors to a second server. So you have two copies of it, active-active, both available at the same time. That means if one fails, the application can fail over to the other side, you have an exact copy of the data. It thinks it's lost a data path, not that it's actually lost one side of the mirror. I've mentioned two, but there's absolutely no reason why you can't expand this to three, four, five, six, seven servers. It's always two-way mirroring, and typically there's a RAID controller underneath here, so you can actually suffer more than two disk failures, Howard. Uh, it depends where those disk failures actually are, because you've got two copies of the data, and you've got RAID, RAID underneath it as well. Howard's right in that if you have more copies of the data, you can have better protection. But what we're trying to do here is keep it cost effective. Try and cover all the situations, try and make it simple, try and make it easy. We're targeting organizations that might have a thousand locations. If you have to put a third server in there, as most of our competitors do, that's 50% of hardware costs across a thousand locations. You don't want to do that. You want to be able to do it in two servers. Because it's designed for entry level, because it's designed for remote office, branch office, the actual resources we require are very, very low. We've written the stack completely ourselves. So you typically just want one virtual CPU, one gig of RAM, and it runs on one gig networking. If you put further network links in there, you can use them. You can aggregate across it. You could have two one gigs, three one gigs, four one gigs, or you can use 10 gig if you want as well. But once more, try and keep the cost down try and keep it simple. From a networking point of view, the front end, whatever your applications are running, that could be running on your normal network. 
But for the marine traffic and for this, the data traffic at the back, we suggest just putting in simple crossover cables, or what we used to call crossover cables, patch cables. You don't need a switch. Keep it simple, keep it light, keep it cost effective, have less components that can actually fail. There is a problem in the industry called split brain or in these type of technologies. And what that is, is what happens if the link between the two systems fail? And this is why most of the people out there say you need to have three nodes. Because what you do if you have split brain is any two nodes that can talk to each other are allowed to modify the data. If a node is isolated, it's not allowed to modify the data. So that's why they insist on three nodes. If you've got a thousand locations, or even if you're a small to medium enterprise, you've added 50% of hardware cost. So right in the data center, you've probably got way more than three nodes. But in a small location, in a remote location, you've added 50% of hardware cost that you don't need. What we do instead is we actually provide a remote neutral storage host. The neutral storage host can actually monitor hundreds of sites. Our largest customer has 2,200 locations. They have one instance of the neutral storage host working in headquarters that's action acting as a quorum device for all of those locations. Easy to manage, very, very cost effective, requires very, very uh, a little bandwidth, and withstands 3,000 3, milliseconds latency. You could stick this thing on the moon. So we have this remote, the remote device, remote heartbeat, that's basically monitoring uh, all of the systems and acts as that, that third node, so you do not have to add the cost of that third node, or you do not need the type of latency or the type of bandwidth that our competitors actually require. From the point of view of actually getting it out there in the first place, you can use System Center, you can use PowerShell, you can use our web GUI, uh, you can actually push out upgrades out to the system. Uh, if you have a failure in the system, we actually store all the configuration information in the remaining server. You can send out another server to the site with a hypervisor installed. Could be completely different manufacturer, completely different configuration, as long as it has the minimum same capability, and we will automatically rebuild that, we will automatically resynchronize that, and have the system running again. So you can actually do uh, failure recovery, you can actually replace failed systems in normal business hours. That can save a lot of money that you're not sending someone to site after midnight when the retail store is closed and you need security to monitor what is going on. From a management point of view, we don't want to insist that you use a management interface different to your already use. So depending on your hypervisor, depending on what you already have, you can manage this through vCenter, a vCenter plugin. You can manage this through System Center in a Hyper-V type environment. We have a web GUI you can use. We have UCS Director if you're in a Cisco type environment. We, we make, try and make it as easy as possible for you to manage as many sites as you wish. So that's the software. But do you want just the software or do you want to buy a solution? We have two very good partners that we're working very closely with where you can actually order the solution directly. One of those is Cisco. And with Cisco, you can use either their E-Series, which is a router with two blades in there for entry-level solutions. You can order their C-Series, uh, which are larger servers. Uh, with, install our software on that. You can order that through Cisco as well uh, to, to, to build a medium-sized hyperconverged solution. Or with their UCS Mini, the software is now being embedded on top of each of the blades within UCS Mini, so you can share the storage on all of those blades. And you can manage all of that through UCS Director. If you want to get very cost effective, we also work closely with Lenovo. Three different models available from Lenovo. With the RS140, you can order a two-server solution with our software installed, fully a, a hyperconverged solution for $5,000. So it's now making it affordable. So the type of locations that are using that with our technology today, restaurant chains, they don't have a lot of data. But there's a lot of applications moving into them, such as people who are ordering online expect to arrive in the restaurant and their meal is ready for them. They're going to take it home. Amazing. So different solutions available, bringing the cost of hyperconvergence down to where large organizations with multiple remote locations can afford it, small to medium enterprises can afford it, different levels of capability depending on what you actually need. So the benefits of what we actually provide to you, we're allowing hyperconvergence to be cost effective, simple, easy to use, does what it says in the tin, available to small to medium enterprises and to multiple or to sites with multiple remote locations. Very small footprint, greatly reducing costs, 
simple, flexible, and with a remote, uh, a remote um, quorum device. <coughs> How widespread is it? Today, we manage 110 petabytes of data. Our typical customer has two to four, two to four terabytes of data. But they, that is per site. They then could have hundreds of thousands of sites. So there are a lot of data they're actually managing through this. We have 1,500 customers worldwide across 23,000 sites. A lot of applications out, a lot of people using it out there. Where does this technology make sense? Education, energy, I already mentioned wind farms, oil rigs, a lot of uh, oil rig companies are using this now as well, finance and banking, governments, hotels, manufacturing, retail. I'll give you a couple of case studies of the type of, of customers using this. Coles is a large department store in the US. So if 1,200 locations, they're using this in every one of those locations. The advantage to them, as an example, in power and cooling alone, in changing to our technology, they're saving $300,000 a year. Previous to us, they had two servers, and they had a storage device. I think actually we mentioned it, it was, it was HP's MSA they were using. They were suffering five failures a week because of the MSA failing, and that was seriously affecting their business. In changing to us, in removing the MSA, the MSA was a single point of failure. With our technology, there is no single point of failure. Anything can fail, server can fail, storage can fail, fails over to the second server. There is no, second, uh, there is no uh, single point of failure. In that particular application, they were using Cisco UCS 240 servers. Um, this rolled out across all the stores over a year ago now and is running smoothly for all of them. Smaller applications, a company called Car Auctions uh, in the US. It's kind of obvious what they do by the name. Um, they're using the Cisco U uh, UCS E-Series servers, which is basically the router with the two blades in it. Uh, their problem was they were suffering failures, and every time there was a failure, they had to fly someone to that remote site. And that was very, very expensive for them. One flight to the site, was uh, sending an engineer time, etc., is more expensive than it costs them to actually put this application in or the increased capability of this application. And a list of some of the customers who are actually using us uh, throughout the world today. Some big names that have been using us for quite some time. So that's the end of the presentation. 